Good morning, and welcome to the Governance for Schools Conference 2021, and specifically this session on becoming and being a church school governor. My name is Matt Long, and I am the Charity Development and Projects Manager here at Governance for Schools, as well as Chair of a MAP Primary School in Croydon. Before I introduce our guest speaker, we just have a few housekeeping points we'd like to cover. Fantastic. Uh, closed captions are available for those who'd like to make use of them, but uh, you do just need to uh, turn them on in your uh, own settings. Uh, speakers have been invited to share a short verbal description of themselves. So uh, to lead that off, uh, I am a white Zimbabwean male, my mid thirties, with a shaved head, beard and glasses, and a white and gray uh, GFS background. Uh, the chat function is disabled. Uh, but you can make use of the Q&A panel to uh, ask any questions, and we will endeavor to get to those uh, after my presentation. If you happen to be dis disconnected, please just rejoin the session through the same link. Uh, when the session is being recorded. We will send a link to the video upload, as well as uh, a link to download slide packs, and as well as further links that Mike has supplied uh, for attendees to, to have a look at on their own time. That'll come out hopefully tomorrow, potentially Monday depending on the upload speed. Uh, please continue to follow the conference. Obviously, this is our second last day. Uh, like, share, spread the word uh, and the resources. And please do make use of the hashtag, hashtag GFS Conference 21. Uh, there'll also be a very quick survey at the end of the session, which we'd greatly appreciate you filling out. Church schools have a unique and important place in the education landscape. And in a similar vein, serving as a governor at a church school offers distinct opportunities and challenges. It is crucial to the success of church schools that serving or prospective governors have a clear idea about what the role entails, what is expected of them in that environment, as compared to secular academies or maintained schools. To that end, we are thrilled to be joined today by our guest speaker, Mike Simmons, who is fresh from the Dyson Governance Group conference last night. Uh, which was, by all accounts, a roaring success. So he's coming in hot. Uh, Mike has served in school governance for over 35 years. His experience has ranged from being on three governance boards to chairing a multi-academy trust of five schools from its inception, as well as on occasions chairing interim executive boards. In recent years, he has developed innovative structures for multi-academy trusts, as well as supporting individual governance boards, carrying out reviews and investigations, developing bespoke training for specific boards, and mentoring individuals. Mike is the author of Church School Governance and is a motivational speaker at Dyson conferences and CPD opportunities, as well as the Diocese of Chelmsford Governance Consultant. As a member of the National Dyson Governance Group and author tutor on the Liverpool Hope University online Church School Governance course, he is an advocate for good governance in Church of England schools. Mike, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm glad I managed to pronounce Dyson right the whole time. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. It's really good to uh, have this opportunity with an introduction like that. Not sure what else I can add, but I gather I ought to say that I am speaking today on behalf of the Diocesan Governors Group. That's uh, governance leads from across England, uh, from each of the dioceses. And um, apart from that, I'm white, I'm a male, I'm British, I'm in my early 60s, I have greying hair and I do wear glasses most of the time. But when I'm not uh, involved in governance, I've got uh, 13 grandchildren and amongst, I suppose we're trying to fill the uh, schools. Um, and amongst the, my interests are not only films, but um, sausages, love, uh, love good quality sausages. So let me, um, uh, let me really press on very quickly and just say, a little bit about last night's conference. Uh, we gathered together governors from across the diocese, across England. Uh, we had in the end about 600 and a few more uh, governors uh, who shared two hours with us with content that ranged from looking at uh, the future of Section 48 SIAMS inspections to uh, listening to the Archbishop of York on a video uh, content. It was a really great evening. And uh, the feedback from that has been fantastic. You will be able to, if you want to access that, uh, get that uh, recording 
uh, hopefully by tomorrow if not Monday <laughs> in the same way as Matt was saying um, and the the link to that is in the middle of the slide bit.ly forward slash 2021 govs do uh, jot that down because it won't be in the information or it may be but it might not be in the information that you get following this session so let's think for a moment about church school governance what does it mean to become a governor in a church school what does it mean to be a governor in a church school church schools have the advantage of having been around a very long time we were as it were right at the start of things over well over 200 years ago uh, but it's not a, a provision that has stood still and in the last number of years just uh, probably seven or eight years the Church of England has worked hard to develop a vision for education to inspire its schools uh, it, the diversity of its schools in diocese after diocese after diocese to uh, be deeply Christian serving the common good that second part really does build on what uh, was the foundation of church schools they were there to meet the needs of uh, the poor uh, to meet the needs of young people children uh, in communities so we uh, are continuing to ensure that Church of England schools are about serving the common good but we're not embarrassed or ashamed of our heritage of the fact that it is part of the Church of England's provision to the to society to the country and so we build on the past whilst working in uh, the present and these are the four quartiles that make up the vision for meeting the educational needs of our children educating for wisdom knowledge and skills educating for hope and aspiration educating for community and living well together educating for dignity and respect uh, I don't have time today to go into the detail of those things they can be explored in other places at other times all of this is the goal is to enable children to discover life in all its fullness whatever that may mean and so we the Church of England work with teachers uh, recently getting the, the rights and the ability to deliver the MPQ program for many many teachers and head teachers and and others Andy Wolf, who is, in, is responsible for all of that, wrote, while our goal may well be flourishing children, for this to be achieved, we must also focus on leadership development and flourishing teachers and leaders. There may be a few flourishing children where there are few flourishing adults. You see how absolutely vital it is that the sector cares for and develops its own people in order to develop and make, meet the needs of our children that they might discover life in all its fullness so there's a big task to do within our church school context that overlaps with what's happening in the wider world of education but has some very distinctive parts to it one of those distinctive parts is some of the questions we ask ourselves so I'm quite keen on looking at uh, the way in which relationships are developed and built within the school the church school context and in, 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 in terms of governors how do we relate to each other how do we relate to our staff and how do we therefore relate to children and parents families that we are serving it's a really important set of questions and uh, it's not an easy one to answer as the quote says relationships are not a one-size thing that fits all we have to be relationship builders many many people are or could be described in that way but I think if you're a Christian who engages in a church school and if you're a Church of England school you will desperately and definitely want to be focused on relationship building the other another thing that uh, equips us really for building relationships providing leadership and modeling good practice within our schools as governors 
is that we take our source of inspiration, of motivation, and sometimes or quite often our understanding, our knowledge and wisdom from the Bible. That's one of our main sources of learning. And this is a Bible verse that I often use to encourage people to think about how they relate to each other, to the decisions they have to make and the needs that they have to meet by looking at, are we, am I someone who chases after justice, faith, love and peace? Am I someone who's gentle, which isn't, doesn't mean being a walkover, it's someone who knows how to build relationship and how, how to engage with individuals? Am I able to teach, not as a teacher in a school, but to teach an understanding, to bring wisdom to the table, as it were, able to bear evil, strong word? Maybe it simply wants to mean something like, you know, when there's angst and uh, people are against us for whatever reason, uh, without resentment. So building strong and good and positive relationships, I'm able to put things right by the way in which we speak to uh, each other and to those that we work with. So much for the background as why church schools, what church schools are, what we're trying to focus in on. Let me just uh, explain for those of you who are not yet church school governors that there are several ways onto a governance board. Can't tell you how many places there will be that will vary from school to school and especially if you're not Matt in a local governing body academy council that may be different again. But in a church school, there will always be foundation governors. In VA schools, they have to be the majority. This always includes the local vicar as an ex officio foundation governor uh, if there's an incumbent in place. And sometimes it's possible for someone else to take their place when uh, uh, there isn't one in post at the time. Others will be appointed by the church PCC, Parish, uh, uh, Parish Parochial Church Council, and uh, the DBE, the Diocesan Board of Education. Some dioceses, it's just the Diocesan Board of Education that appoint. And then there will be parent governors, an election a, amongst the parent body. And then the governing board as it exists will co-opt other people onto that board. You will also have a representative from the staff and the head teacher who is an ex, ex officio head teacher. And then some schools, well, most maintained schools, will have a local authority appointed governor. Today, these days, we're looking particularly for skills. I think there's also a drive now beginning to look at diversity. Diversity in terms of youth or younger people, of male, female gender, but also and specifically uh, around people of colour or the BAME community, uh, however you want to describe that. So we're looking to ensure that around the table there are a mix of people that can bring their experience, their knowledge, their wisdom, even though they are probably mostly lay people who don't have a great understanding of education. It's one of the best ways of discovering what education is really all about. Uh, and learning uh, is right at the top of the chart, as it were, to uh, ensure that you are able to fulfill the role. Learning by attending training, but learning as well by listening and thinking and watching uh, and seeking to get under the skin of what's going on in your school. But it's also about influence, positive influence for good. Let me say a word here about parents. Uh, once you're elected, you don't represent the parent body in that you have to take their views. You're there in your own right uh, as having been appointed. And it's really important at that point that you recognise you're there for all the children in the school, not just your child or not just your child's teacher. You are there for all. And many Christians and you don't have to be a Christian to be a governor on a school governing board, but many who are practicing Christians will see this as a ministry, a way of them sharing their life, their faith life, if you like, their relationship with God in a context that will benefit all. But it is not primarily 
a role to actually push your particular individual theological perspectives. Again, it's a corporate body where as we together explore each other's views on whatever it is, we come to conclusions, a conclusion that collective responsibility means we need to stand by. But if you are uh, a person of faith, then I think these four P's may help you to see some of the potential of being involved as a governor. So the pastoral side of it is the caring side, if you like, being able to show a real interest in support and support for people within the school context. Looking at the provision of the school, what is it providing? What kind of education? What kind of curriculum? How is that influenced by, for example, the Church of England vision for education? Practical. It's not to get involved in all the operational stuff that's down to the head teacher, but practical in, in the sense of it, you're making a real difference. You're making some decisions that will affect the future and the, the, the running of the school. And more controversial, I suppose, prophetic. It depends on your meaning, uh, what you mean by the word prophetic. It has different interpretations within the Christian community, but actually having a voice in that is in many ways influenced by not only your faith, but your understanding, growing understanding of how the Bible might be applied to everyday life. Like all governors, it is vital to be signed up to the seven Nolan principles of public life to ensure that uh, uh, this is a, a role where you are open, where you have objectivity and integrity and so on. It's really important and that's usually part of a code of conduct that you will sign. But I often suggest that in the church school context, we might want to take a fresh look at the, uh, uh, the Beatitudes and ask ourselves, how do the Beatitudes, those first verses in the Sermon on the Mount, how do they inform me, my thinking, my behaviour, my attitudes and my input? Because, of course, as I've already said, it's a corporate body. It's a it, collective responsibility is the byword in terms of the processes that we go through and the decisions that we make. And therefore, governance is not just about the one voice. I came across this quote from uh, uh, in a book called Heads You Win by Geoffrey Archer. He uh, uh, quotes the Duke of Wellington, who after chairing his first cabinet meeting as prime minister, was surprised to find his colleagues didn't seem willing simply to carry out his orders, but actually wanted to discuss alternatives. It was some time before the Iron Duke was prepared to accept that his fellow cabinet ministers might have opinions of their own. Uh, maybe that's a message for the government of the day, but it's certainly a message for governors. How willing are we to be part of an exploration of ideas when we are part of a governing board? Now, what we do as governors is laid down in uh, uh, the governance handbook provided by the Department for Education. Basically, there are three key areas of responsibility. There are many things that come under that which we won't go into today, but the first of these three is ensuring clarity of vision and strategic direction. It is John Carver, the uh, uh, governance guru, who said governance is not about budget lines, personal issues and equipment approvals. It's about values and vision and strategic leadership. And church school governors, governance needs to play, pay a lot of attention to that because we are people of vision for whatever reason. We have the Church of England vision for education. Each school will develop its own vision for education. And in a church school, that needs to be underpinned by some theological understanding. Uh, and people are around to help to develop that vision in order to ensure that the school is moving in, uh, as it were, the, the direction of its choice. And it's the governance board who has the ultimate responsibility. Secondly, a second area of responsibility is holding executive leaders to account for educational performance and the performance management of staff. Uh, until a couple of years ago, that used to all be about data. Uh, it's not so much about data now, but will be again in the future. Um, 
And whilst governors only carry out the performance management of the head teacher, uh, the uh, performance management staff is delegated to the head teacher. Third area is overseeing financial performance, making sure the money is well spent. And uh, that's all in the area of budgeting and financial accountability. But I always say that in the church school, there's a fourth area of responsibility that I've been alluding to since I started this session. It's securing the Christian character of the school. How important is that? Lots of ways in which that will happen and a whole training sessions will be run by your diocese uh, in order to help you with that kind of area. But here's just three potential uh, questions or uh, that might be asked in the intent of uh, ensuring that we're pursuing an agenda that is informed by Christian thinking. So how far are behaviour policies and school rules based on Christ a Christian understanding of justice? Secondly, another one, schools should be outstanding places of hope. Is that how you see your school? How do you move that forward? And third area, uh, and there are many others, Church schools should be places that understand and exemplify what it means to be a community of forgiveness. In what ways is your school a place of forgiveness? Can't be ignored because right at the heart of the Christian faith is that, that uh, offer of forgiveness. And uh, it's in the Lord's Prayer that is prayed probably every day in church schools during collective worship. So asking questions like this is really valuable and important. But there are, of course, lots of practical things that have to be done within the government's governance uh, context. Disc divided these up into moral and legal responsibilities and delegated responsibilities. Again, not to unpack that this morning, but that is often a way of looking at what is it actually we've got to do when it comes to the agenda of governing body meetings and the decisions that we have to make. And I suppose at the end of the day, the biggest area is accountability because in accountability we're not only holding to account the head teacher and the performance of the school but we're also responsible and accountable in many different ways through all sorts of re uh, opportunities that uh, uh, we will have to explore so in terms of holding to account we will see all kinds of report reports and be reported to and we need to look at those, explore those, critique them, ask, qu ask uh, questions around them to ensure that what we're being told is actually what's happening on the ground. And so as a part of that, we collect evidence, evidence from the head teacher uh, or the senior leadership team, from teachers talking to children, from what you see on the walls, from looking at children's books and children's uh, and the resources that are being used. Now, all this seems really big and heavy. If you've been a governor for a while, you'll know some of this uh, stuff goes on. If you're not yet a governor, uh, don't let this put you off because it, you learn about it over time. The first year can be a little bit of a blur as you get to grips with some of this stuff. But, and you'll be taught and trained and supported and helped, hopefully, to uh, engage in some of this. But over all of that, you're simply collecting evidence. You're not making judgment. That's what differs between this and an inspector coming into the school. A governor does not make judgments. They simply look to see what is happening against what has been planned. We call that monitoring. Are the plans being implemented? Is there evidence and success to celebrate? Or is there, so are there some issues that need to be addressed? And helpful to that process are the statutory inspections that we have, uh, SIAMS inspections. Uh, they're starting again uh, beginning October uh, because we're playing, they're playing catch up from uh, when they, were, they ceased back in March 2020. Uh, uh, and that's a whole other subject. But there's also Ofsted. Whilst SIAMS looks at how the school is, is developing and fulfilling its Christian vision, Ofsted is looking at the hard data, uh, the hard facts about the uh, uh, performance of the schools. Both are looking for impact. Both are looking to give a judgment that will help us to move forward. 
they're often seen quite negatively but ideally they can be embraced as a way of saying well these are areas where we're doing well these are areas where we can do better so as I come to a close and uh, look forward to seeing uh, some of your questions and hearing some of your questions going forward for the rest of the session here are just some tips some top tips if you like for being an effective governor first of all foster a relationship with the head teacher get to know them and build that relationship and uh, and watch that relationship not to get cozy but to ensure that the head teacher understands and respects you and you understand and respect them insist on the well-being needs of staff this has come to the head during the pandemic and this becomes a priority of governing boards how are we uh, ensuring the well-being of our head teacher of our staff and providing for the needs of children thirdly focus on the strategic and not the operational the head teacher needs to be released to get on with running their school and we need to look at the strategic overarching things that uh, equip and enable the head teacher to do that again each of these could be a session in themselves one that I'm, in, I'm now putting into my training is to use a coaching model to enable discussion based my thinking on a book called the basic coaching method um, and the kind of questions that you might ask you often find that giving challenge asking questions can be quite confrontational so by using coaching style questions like which of these might be your preferred option before coming down on you know often going straight in I don't think that's a good idea which of these would be your preferred option or what circum what are the circumstances in which you would want me to whatever it is just thinking about those open-ended questions I think is a, a, an ideal way of helping governors uh, helping head teachers to value the input of governance training have a look at your governing body how often have people been attending training that's provided by the local authority by the diocese or having training on their governing body uh, if we don't get trained we won't know what we're doing and then model with others what you expect of them so if you expect respect be respectful if you expect openness be open and and so on there's lots of ways to ex to open and explore that well that's more or less what I wanted to say before the questions just to finish with a couple of uh, uh, things uh, on, on the right of the screen you can see the back end of a boat I jumped off that boat my wife and I and we were swimming in the deep sea when we were on holiday one day when we got back into the boat um, we noticed as we were eating our lunch that the waves were getting choppier and choppier and choppier in fact by the time we set off back home uh, they were so high that we were in danger of flooding the boat was in danger of flooding it was a really scary trip back that took three hours to get back when it only took a half an hour to get to where we dropped anchor to swim in the sea choppy waters stormy waters a real issue for uh for us on that uh, that holiday and it just reminds me of a quote in a book called hit the ground kneeling a book about reflection by the archbishop of york stephen cotterell he wrote leading an organization or community today is therefore more like steering a ship in choppy waters than like driving a car down a motorway there's two points i want to make this morning from that the first is we need each other to face the the storms the choppy waters of each week each month each term and secondly we know that whilst there are lots of regulations and there are p p parameters within which we all need to work we don't have the ideal road map to help us with every decision that's where knowledge and wisdom and discernment comes into the conversation that as church school governors we will want to uh, be reflective about and we will want to ensure uh, that are, we are they are followed and third point as I finish is this it's a terrible thing to I think to in life to wait until you're ready 
I have this feeling now actually no one is ever ready to do anything, says Hugh Laurie. There's almost no thing as, such thing as ready. There's only now, and you may well as well do it now. So, friends, if you are thinking about becoming a church school governor, do it. <laughs> talk to your diocese, talk to your local church schools, find a vacancy, and go on that learning journey that will take you time, but will benefit uh, others. If you're already on that journey, you're part of a governing body, think about some of the things I've thrown into the conversation this morning and see if you can't actually take some steps forward in applying what you believe and what the needs of the school are as you go forward. As Matt mentioned, I've written a book called uh, Church School Governance. It's just a small, short book. You can uh, buy that uh, at that web address at the bottom and that will be in the notes that you have afterwards. But I'm also a tutor on the Liverpool Hope online um, governance course. This is a uh, six month course, six topics, three, three weeks per topic that gives you, gives you a much more in-depth understanding of what it means to be a governor in a church school. You engage with a tutor, you engage with follow, fellow students, and uh, many people have found this to be a really life changer in terms of equipping them for their role as a church school governor. So I'd recommend you have a look, look that up, Google or look at hope.ac.uk, find the Improving Church School Governance course and you can get all of the details there. But it's high time I stopped speaking and you had the opportunity to uh, ask those questions and to uh, for me to see if I can uh, answer them. So if I stop sharing now, um, I, Matt will now take back on control. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, as you said, obviously an awful lot there, but thank you so much for uh, running us through that as well as providing all the various links and resources. To that end, we will be sharing uh, slides, as I said, linked to the video, as well as some other links Mike has provided. Uh, Hopefully we can get that link for the conference. Uh, I don't know, Mike, if you have an opportunity, if you can maybe drop it in the chat uh, so people can click through. But an awful lot of questions, which is fantastic. Uh, so let's get straight in. Uh, a few of them were slightly related. So one was, I think, uh, coming off of your point around diversity on boards, Mike, was querying about perhaps governors of different faiths. Does Is that something that is desirable? Uh, as part of that diversity view. And on a related note, just more broadly, what is the church's view of non-Christian governors on church school governing boards? Uh, just put the conference link in the chat. Thanks, Mike. That's perfect. Yes. Um, in terms of people who are not Christians be it joining governing boards, that is that happens pretty much everywhere. Um, what you need as a someone who isn't of the Christian faith to be able to do is to say, well, I, uh, I can, I understand what the school stands for, I understand the school's vision, I am empathetic with it, uh, or sympathetic to it. I will not try to work against it, but uh, to look at bringing my skills to the areas that I have uh, experience and knowledge of. So, people of if you might like no faith, another faith, that's not an issue. As long as you recognize, simplest way of putting it, over the door of, or the gate of the school or on the school board notice board, it will say Church of England School. Therefore, it stands for a certain set of things uh, that will be identified within the vision and values of that school. Therefore, um, if I can, if I as someone who's not of faith can sign up to that in terms of, I accept that's what the school's about, not an issue. Sorry, uh, I got to unmute myself there. Fantastic, thank you, Mike. Uh, hopefully uh, that answers that question. But we have a related one uh, in some ways. As a church governor, how would you broach the issue of uh, serving on a school board where you feel the school has potentially strayed from having that Christian character? I think if um, if you're a foundation governor, you need to have informal uh, conversations with the um, incumbent. 
uh, and or other foundation governors to explore what that may that means what you what, what what you would think you would challenge but never leave the head teacher out of those conversations respect the leader of the school if you like and begin to explore that i wouldn't simply bring that up at a governor's meeting i kind of personally have a a, a mantra that is um, no surprises as far as the head teacher or the chair of governors is concerned at a governing body meeting so if you want to bring up something challenging by all means do that but have had the conversation with both head and chair uh, that leads to you being given the opportunity to bring that up um, one of the ways in which such a, a situation as you put to me can be worked through is revisiting the vision of the school um, now one of the excuses if you like for doing that and not necessarily the best reason but one of the excuses is preparing for SIAMs there's quite a lot being said these days about don't prepare for SIAMs be ready for SIAMs be all that that science schedule expects of you but uh, uh, there was always a, a point where we need to revisit the vision or we need to, and, and particularly now with the more recent um, schedule where the biblical under, underpinning of the vision needs to be really clearly understood by everybody in the community so there are those kinds of times when you can begin to address where there seems to be moving away from the historic or foundational view or, or a purpose of the school Fantastic. Uh, question from Susan. How does the church manage relationships with church schools in non C of E mats? What differences are there in the differing top line mission statements of the mat, which has both uh, church schools and non church schools within its uh, group? Yeah, I think across the country, this is a minority situation because, on the whole, and it's not true in every diocese, on the whole, to be uh, to join a mat as a church school, it needs to be a church school mat. However, there are some mixed mats, of course, and uh, in those situations, there are several things have to happen. One is the articles of association need to allow for or require um, a church school presence on the members' level of of, of governance. Um, that necessarily won't necessarily be followed through in the director trustee level but often is um, secondly when a church school mat comes into a mix mat there are arrangements made for that mat that church school to maintain its uh, christian distinctiveness is the language we often used and uh, and its church school character that has to be protected and so therefore um, the individual um, boards need to respect and, and work with that and it needs to be challenged if that's not, not happening and it can be challenged by the diocese or by the church or by the local board. Um, there's those levels of activity if you like to, to, not, to actually protect that church school nature within the context of the mat. I'm not sure what happens about in terms of overall vision. Often you can get behind uh, non-church vision as long as the church school has, uh, uh, has has that church school vision. That's important because, of course, as I said, there's a Simon's inspection going to happen that's going to inspect its church school miss. I hope that answered that question. Fantastic. I had so that, and, and uh, I guess if if you do need clarification uh or have further thoughts drop them in the q a or alternatively obviously i'm sure you can reach out to uh, to mike after the fact yeah. uh question from tudor my study which is a uh, master's on missional leadership has shown that key to developing christianity in schools amongst children are christian staff where staff don't have much faith experience how can one nurture this as a foundation governor without coming over as being intrusive or overbearing um, I don't doubt the study at all. Uh, I, I guess that I know that would make a huge difference to pursuing the goal. What has really encouraged me enormously in church schools 
is how people who even people who not are not of faith get behind the needs that there are to um, help children to develop and flourish in their understanding of the Christian faith and uh, and the nature of that church school so it is encouraging how that does seem to work and um, get how does a foundation governor get alongside I think by modeling it's always about modeling and relationship um, and uh, helping or making decisions as a governing board about what's expected within the strategic plan um, uh, that embraces and encompasses and obviously everybody needs to work to the strategic plan and the head teacher will need to, to uh, hold their staff to account for that through the normal processes um, so there are checks and balances to try and ensure that this follows through uh, in every way and let's face it I don't think there's a teacher in a church school that wouldn't want them to get at least good uh, as an outcome from a science inspection um, so that will drive them for the five now eight years of uh, living before an inspection if you're only uh, if, if, if you've got that length of time uh, and obviously an inspection isn't the main cause but it is a way of checking and balancing Uh, from Steve, in my experience as a former chair and vice chair in two uh, Church of England schools, as well as current associate member in another, the difference between strategic and operational can be a difficult one for governors, particularly where governance has not moved on in terms of understanding, and there is sometimes too cozy a relationship. Any thoughts on how governors can sharpen up their practice in this respect? Steve, you've identified a very real issue um, across the piece, really. Um, I'm dealing with schools at the moment uh, where I support, um, where op getting involved in the operational, which is almost always so much easier. You know, a discussion about the colour of paint in the toilets uh, typically can be something that can take hours. Um, <laughs> and it's not, it's operational, it's not strategic. But the, the line between strategic and operational can be very difficult to, um, to, to actually draw. So one or two suggestions. One is to go through uh, you know, the last two or three sets of minutes and highlight anything that you think might have been an operational discussion in one colour and anything that might have been a strategic discussion in another colour. Um, and you'll be interesting to see which of the colours um, are most which 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 one has the most colors and that would just start to guide you into thinking should we be spending our time on that I think if you are focused on the school development or improvement plan and you're focused on um, financial accountability the budget and, the, and monitoring that uh, you can't go so far wrong because those are the two key or two of the key responsibilities obviously there are lots of other bits and pieces that you can pick up from training and from the uh, um, uh, from the governance handbook by the way the governance handbook is not there just to sit in our inboxes it really should be right beside you and checking out should we be doing this do we need to do this um, can we do this um, but the school improvement plan development plan uh, and responding to Ofsted responding to science inspection reports uh, and then alongside that the um, uh, financial responsibility those are some of the key strategic things to get focused on and basically Steve I'd say have a discussion about it have have put on the table draw up a list of two on the board two things two one list that tells you says these are some of the operational things we're doing another one a list of those um, more op uh, more strategic things you need to do or ask your diocesan advisor if you can give a training session on it. I'm doing well, one about three advice. weeks time. <laughs> uh, brilliant. From Andrew, how much time do you think a governor spend per term with the head and a nominated class to build effective governance relationships, especially if co-opted into this role without overdoing or underdoing things? Yeah, this is how long old you lock uh, <laughs> space? yeah i i think every case will be different because it does depend upon your availability in the first place to be in school during 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 school time 
because often that's when those conversations and meetings need to happen. Uh, I wouldn't expect a chair of governors to meet necessarily every week with the head, but uh, certainly every two or three weeks, because those are key conversations uh, 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 for the head and chair to have, both as a relationship builder, um, but also as an accountability, um, com um, not, not, I wasn't meaning quite a, um, accountability, critical friend style conversation. A phrase that's not used as much now, but head teachers, good head teachers used to value that opportunity to throw things be past their chair or other governor and get feedback and sharpen the the whole I idea that's coming out. Um, I, I like the proverb that talks about iron sharpening iron, how important it is that those conversations happen. Um, and so uh, that has to happen quite regularly. Other governors, I think it needs to be focused on uh, why am I going in? Not just to be the nice person or to deliver cakes. There may be times to do that. But uh, specifically, what does the governing body need me to deal with, to look at is a better word. Um, what do I need to go and monitor? What in the school improvement plan might I have the expertise or the naivety to go and see what the evidence is and be able to report it back. Again, I reiterate what I said earlier, not to make judgments about how good, bad or indifference that is. But definitely don't make yourself a bother. That, that you know, no. <laughs> not too permanent a fixture. Yeah. Yeah, uh, fantastic. Uh, from Joe, can you say a bit more about Siams versus Ofsted? Or perhaps as, as contrasted with? Hopefully they're not in conflict. Uh, I have become a foundation governor recently, but have 12 years experience of governance in community schools. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, yeah good, good question, Joe. Um, I could easily get out of that one by saying watch the, um, uh, the, the conference last night uh, when, you, when, it's up, when it's uploaded, uh, because the national director of SIAMS was really helpful on the purpose of SIAMS inspections and how they're going to operate um, and how whilst there may be some schools that can achieve excellence that uh, that is that is not going to be for all um, being good is good in 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 science in science inspections uh, what else is different um, I think in Ofsted terms we're desperately trying to tick a lot of boxes to get things right and to please the inspector that the inspector sees that we're performing well in every area um, and of course normally based on data uh, there's a lot more to it than that but that, that that may be some people's perspective of it SIAMS is supposedly not meant to be a tick box exercise and um, Margaret James last night was very clear don't go through the schedule and tick with your inadequate good or possibly excellent. That's not the purpose of the schedule, uh, but work on all of those things to embed them deeply into the life of the school in every area of the school. So I think it's really important for us to recognize SIAMS being, uh, or treat SIAMS as being much more developmental and not really just a snapshot view though it will appear to be because it takes place over the one or whatever days. Um, whereas Ofsted does appear to be, you know, a marker in the sand that makes you um, look on look good or not um, and is much more challenging in that respect. Having said that, I've been through several cyber inspections and sometimes they are more difficult than uh, an Ofsted inspection. And I think that they were under the past, the previous schedule. But I think it's because you just so desperately want to be seen well, well as a good uh, as a good church school. Um, maybe the secret is to be a good school, not work towards building towards being a good school. Get on with the job and get it done um, well before any inspection is due. I suppose you could say the same for Ofs Ofsted. That's fantastic, fantastic advice. Um, and then potentially our last question. Uh, how do church governors help children of different faiths flourish? So I suppose more, how do church governors help schools to help children 
of different faiths flourish. Yes, I mean, a question you might ask your um, head teacher or your RE lead or your collective worship lead is just that. How are you helping children of other faiths to uh, flourish in the community of the school? Really important question. Uh, and it's not for governors really to, um, to tell the school what they should be doing in that respect. Uh, this differs from school to school. So there are some church schools that are predominantly uh, Muslim in terms of the pupil population, uh, especially secondary schools in certain areas of the school country. I think I would say the important thing to remember is that whilst they may be the only option in some places, quite often uh, Muslim parents, Islamic parents, choose church schools because they know the values that will be taught um, and will be developed through the life of the school and they, they 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 value that they think that's a really helpful important thing so again it's not being ashamed that this is a church of england school or that we have a christian vision that uh, may be developed because in a different way to another school because of the population of children or the numbers of uh, children from other faiths um, and so develop that vision and those values within the life of the school and of course um, all schools will be teaching uh, other faiths as well as the Christian faith through RE um, they may or may not have any uh, acts of collective worship it's less likely uh, that of another faith but uh, RE definitely, they will be looking at uh, two or three other religions during the course of the school life. So, um, that, and that needs to be done well. And uh, visitors from other faiths coming in to talk about that, their faith would be, I'm sure, extremely welcome and probably organized by uh, RE leads and head teachers. So we do, I'm sure schools do look at the flourishing of uh, all children uh, in partic their particular needs. Fantastic, Mike. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, to everyone who has engaged uh, with the uh, Q&A panel. It's been heck of a lovely. So, uh, yeah, it's, and much appreciated. Uh, a lot to unpack there. Uh, so, unfortunately, we are coming up to the end of the session. I would like to thank Mike for the benefit of his time and insight, as well as all of you for attending. For those who are interested in becoming a school governor, we have a webinar tomorrow at 1.15 p.m outlining the role and process. It's an opportunity to see if it might be for you. Uh, for those who are looking to recruit governors, we have a session today at 4 p.m. Uh, on how we might help uh, you with, out with that. Please continue to support the conference. I would like to draw particular attention to a session tomorrow at 4 p.m. launching our new campaign, All Pupils, Every Ambition. We'll be exploring challenges and opportunities related to gaps in attainment and life outcome. Uh, please also look out for our follow-up email with all those pertinent links and resources that Mike has asked us to share, as well as his contact details. Thank you again for coming and have a wonderful day.